Good morning, people of God. I greet you this morning in the wonderful and blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking God for the privilege of another day on this side of heaven, for his mercy and for his grace, for the abundance of his kindness and his great love towards each of us. Today is the first Sunday of August, and as a result, we will uh, partake of communion at the conclusion of today's message. So make sure you have your bread and uh, juice or whatever you uh, choose to drink to celebrate the uh, blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Make sure also this morning, again, you um, share your uh, Facebook page with someone so that they could be blessed by today's word. It's a rich, rich, wonderful word. Um, your presence is a blessing to me. Uh, we welcome those who are joining by a conference call and you have joined by a Facebook. So I'm going to have a word of prayer with you, and then we will um, be ministered to by two wonderful women of God, um, two selections, and then following their, their sharing with us um, through music, um, I'll bless you with the word of God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, by your grace we have come to the start of a new week, even a new month. You have been exceedingly gracious to us, even in the midst of so much chaos and difficulty. Your presence is always a blessing in our life. We are eternally dependent upon you for all things. Our faith is in you, our trust is in you. Our confidence is that you will fulfill your word to take care of us, that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us that you will lead and guide us into all truth. Thank you for this privilege of being able to share the word of God again another Sunday morning, for this chance to worship you even while away from the saints, yet with the saints. We just pray for believers all over this world, preachers who will preach this morning, those who will minister in song. We just pray, God, you will lift the hearts of every believer today Use each of us for your glory. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let each of you say amen. Give the Lord some praise from where you are. He's worthy of the praise. Let's hear from uh, two wonderful women of God. Praise the Lord, children of the Most High God. As we are distant from one another, let's not create distance between us. Let's not create distance between us and our God by offering up lazy worship. So stand to your feet wherever you are this morning, and I pray that you'll worship with me as I sing You Are God Alone by William McDowell. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any more man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your hand.
Jesus, 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 Jesus. 
Most gracious God, our Father, we humbly bow before you, acknowledging your greatness, that we are indebted to you. Our lives are laid bare before you. Thank you for forgiving us for our sins, for having mercy on our souls. Thank you for your great love for each one of us. Bless the word as I share it now. Please let it minister to every heart. Use me for your glory, for the building up of the body of Christ. We love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, precious people of God. Thank you so much, Sister Holman and Sister Sherelle, for ministering to our souls this morning. Saints, again, um, make sure you share the message today on, our, on your Facebook page. It's a rich word. I think it's going to really bless you. And also, remember, we will have communion um, at the conclusion of today's message because today is first Sunday. Amen. Good morning to each of you. I greet you each in the wonderful and blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, it is indeed a privilege and an honor to share with you one more time. Thank you for tuning into uh, this morning's broadcast. Um, for you who are with us for the first time, again, I'm Pastor Pillar, pastor at Fort Washington Baptist Church, where we have some of God's most precious and most beautiful saints. Thank you for today. Um, your presence is a blessing. In our uh, series, uh, Encouragement for Suffering Saints, um, from 1 Peter, today I want to share a message with you um, that I titled, uh, Become Like Christ. Become Like Christ. In a publication of a Discipleship Journal edition, Carol Mayhall tells of a woman who went to a diet center to lose weight. The director took Carol to a full-length mirror. On the mirror, the director outlined a figure and told Carol, this is what I want you to be like at the end of the program. Days of intense dieting and exercise followed. And every week, Carol would stand in front of the mirror, discouraged because her bulging outline did not fit the director's ideal. But Carol kept at it until finally one day her body conformed to the longed for image. How did Carol ultimately conform her body to fit the image in the mirror? First, she had to keep her eyes on the image. By doing so, Carol could see how far she was from being conformed to the image. Daily, regularly, she had to look at the image that she wanted to conform to. She had to keep her eyes on the image. Second, Carol had to change her life in order to conform to the image. She had to diet. That is, she had to remove some things out of her life. Her habits had to change. She also had to exercise now, which means she had to discipline herself to get up and to do those things physically that were necessary to conform her body to the image on the mirror, which means also then that Carol's priorities had to change. Sacrifices she had not been making, she now had to make. Both when she felt like exercising and when she did not, Carol had to exercise. When she felt like putting foods away, 
And when she wanted to eat everything within an arm's reach, Carol had to make the choice to put the foods away. She had to have discipline, had to make sacrifices, had to change priorities. Changes had to be made in Carol's life for her to conform to the image. She had to first keep her eyes on the image. Second, she had to change her life to conform to the image. And then third, Carol had to stay encouraged, or better yet, keep herself from becoming discouraged. Why? Because conforming to the image would not happen with one exercise, nor would it happen over a week of passing up on cheesecake or buttermilk biscuits with gravy. There were days, maybe weeks, of looking in that mirror, seeing no change. There may have been days when Carol fell back to old habits and weight that she had taken off had been put back on. Whatever the experience was, Carol had to figure out how to stay encouraged, to keep trying to not give up, even when change was horribly slow. Conforming to that image in the mirror was hard, difficult, challenging, and required discipline, changing of priorities, sacrifice, and doing whatever she could to remain encouraged. But fourth, I think, Carol needed to be inspired. Someone had to say to Carol, I believe in you. You can do this. I see the progress you're making. You're stronger today than you were yesterday. More fit than you were before. More disciplined. You're making more sacrifices. Your priorities are in order. You're making courage. You are optimistic. Someone needed to say to her, I see your work. It's paying off. And inspire Carol to not give up. And finally, fifth, I think Carol needed faith. Each pound lost. Each inch, her waist got smaller. Each day when she exercised, each day that she held to her new priorities was a reason for celebrating and now believing that what she did not yet see, that if she kept doing what she was doing, kept listening to what she was being coached to do, if she kept making the sacrifices, remained disciplined, continued in those priorities, if she stayed encouraged, if she had that voice of inspiration in her ear and listened, if she kept the faith, if she persevered, her body would conform to the image set before her. Carol's witness is that her body had changed. Our God has drawn an image on a mirror that we are to conform to. It's the image of Christ, his son, our savior. You and I are called to become like Christ, to conform to his image, to have it before us and to look at it and to have faith and make, have discipline and make sacrifices and reorder priorities so that the image of Christ we're looking at might also now become the image others see when they look at us. We've been called to become like Christ. How do we conform to the image of Christ? 
what do we have to do? Here's the first thing. To conform to the image of Christ. Here's what we got to do. Number one, endure unjust suffering like Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 21. It reads, For you have been called, 1 Peter 2 and 21, For you have been called, for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Observe what we see here. At verse 22, Christ committed no sin. Amen. Verse 21. We've been called to follow the example of Christ. That is in what? Committing no sin. Amen. The noun translated sin is hamatia, a Greek noun. It literally means a failing to hit the mark. Christ never committed sin. That is, he never failed to hit the mark of righteousness, of right living, of always doing what's right in God's sight. Never one time did he not hit the mark. He never failed to meet God's expectations. He obeyed the laws, the commandments, the precepts, the ordinances of God. He always hit the mark. And in doing so, he left us this example to follow in his steps. To make it our business to hit the mark. In the context of these verses, Jesus suffered for sin. At verse number uh, 21, Peter writes, For you have been called for this purpose, as Christ also suffered for you. What did he suffer for? He suffered for sin. For who? For you, for me, for those in Peter's day, for everyone who has or will ever live at verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Jesus suffered for our sins. Watch this now. He never committed sin. He never missed the mark of righteousness. He never sinned with his lips. At verse number 22, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He never missed the mark. He never sinned with his lips. There was no deceit in his mouth. He never lied. He never misled anyone. He never told an untruth. He was never dishonest. He never sinned with his life. He never did anything outside the will of God. That means then, he did not deserve to suffer for sin. It was unjust suffering. We deserve to suffer for sin. But for our sake, he endured unjust undeserved, unmerited suffering and left us an example to follow in his steps to do what? To endure what? Unjust, undeserved suffering. Here's the point. We dealt with this last week and the week before. If even when you submit to governing authorities by obeying laws, you still suffer.
suffer unjustly, if even when you submit to employers, they treat you unreasonable, evil, or unfair, causing you unjust suffering, if even when a wife submits to her husband, he treats her unkind, causing her unjust suffering, if even when a husband lives with his wife in an understanding way, she still won't submit to him, causing him unjust suffering, you who are suffering unjustly, conform to the image of Christ, endure unjust suffering, just like Christ. How do I endure it? Like Christ, what do I do while I'm enduring it? Don't sin with your life. Don't respond to their evil with evil. Become like Christ. Don't use your freedom for evil at verse 16. Become like Christ. Don't give anyone any reason to accuse you of also being evil. Conform to the image of Christ. Don't sin with your lips, with the words that pour out of your mouth. Don't be vulgar. Don't be obscene. Don't be vile. Don't be cruel. Don't be hurtful. Don't be evil. Don't be mean-spirited. Don't be slanderous. Don't let your mouth be the source of sin. Conform your mouth to the image of the mouth of Christ. Hit the mark of righteousness with your lips and your life. Keep doing what's right with your lips and your life because this finds favor with God. I know you're going through it. I know it's painful. I know it's hard. I know it's not right what he did to you, what she did to you, what they collaborated and did to you. I know you feel you don't deserve to be treated that way. Neither did Christ. He did not deserve what was done to him. He endured unjust suffering for you and for me. So then you and I, what do we do? We say for the glory of Christ, to reveal Christ's likeness in us, to reveal that we have conformed to the image of Christ, we will endure the suffering without committing sin in the midst of the suffering. We will not respond to evil the way we have been treated with evil. We're going to aim for the mark of righteousness. We're going to hit it this time. We missed it yesterday. Missed it last week. Missed it last month. Did evil for evil, tat for tat, but not today. We have decided we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to have discipline. We're going to persevere. We're going to maintain faith. That the image set before us is possible. We're going to conform to the image of Christ. And in doing so, cause others who do not see Jesus to now see the Lord Jesus. We're going to keep our eyes on him. And enable us, enable ourselves to see where we are. We're going to keep looking at Jesus so we can see how much more we need to change. We're going to keep looking at Jesus. And discipline ourselves to change and reorder priorities so that more and more each day we begin to look like Jesus. We're not going to give up. We're going to conform to his image. We've got to persevere. Why? Because we've been called for this very purpose. First thing we're going to do to become like Christ is we've got to endure unjust suffering. I know it ain't right. I know it seems unfair. I know it feels unjust. But he did it for us. So that now you and I, to glorify him, must endure unjust suffering without committing sin. Here's the second thing we've got to do. Just like Christ, is we've got to 
You've got to entrust yourself to God just like Christ. Entrust yourself to God like Christ. Look at verse 23. Look how it reads there. Verse 23 of 1 Peter chapter 2. It reads, And while being reviled, did not revile in return. He did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now watch. To be reviled is to be insulted unjustly and angrily criticized, demeaned, berated, verbally abused, while being insulted, unjustly and angrily criticized, demeaned, berated, verbally abused, while being called obscene and vulgar, dehumanizing names, while being sinned against by the mouths of many, not even one time did Jesus revile in return. He left us an example to conform to, that you nor I we don't have to sin with our mouth in response to the sins from the mouth of others. You do not have to call others vulgar, obscene, and evil names because they have done that towards you. While Jesus was suffering unjustly, he says while he was being reviled and while suffering, while suffering unjustly because they tore the skin off his back, while suffering unjustly from being beaten in his face and upon his head, while Jesus was suffering unjustly from the thorns they forcefully put down on his head, while Jesus was suffering unjustly from having left heaven and came to his own and his own seeing him rejected him and asked for a criminal to be released from death rather than he who is a righteous king while Jesus was suffering unjustly a criminal's death on a cross with nails in his hands and in his feet never one time did he threaten those who caused his suffering he uttered no threats. Never one time did he accuse. Never one time did he threaten to do anything to those who caused his suffering. Instead, lifting his eyes to glory, he kept entrusting himself, giving his life over to him who judges righteously. Continually, he placed his life in the hands of him who judges righteously. Jesus knew, listen to me, that the judge of the highest court would look at the evidence and see that Jesus broke no laws deserving death. He never sinned. And therefore, the righteous judge who judges everyone according to righteousness, would exonerate Jesus, find Jesus not guilty of sin, undeserving of death, and meriting life. Jesus knew that the righteous judge would look at the evidence of those who crucified him and find them guilty of having sinned against him with their lips and their life find them guilty of having sinned against God. Jesus then sets an example for us, conform to his image. When you suffer unjustly, don't revile in return. When they slander, you don't slander back. When they insult, you don't insult back. When they criticize you and demean you, don't criticize and demean back. 
When they berate you, do not respond back. When they verbally abuse you and assault you, keep your mouth shut. Utter no threats. Lift your eyes to heaven and entrust yourself to God like Jesus. Don't sin and the righteous judge will look at the evidence and will exonerate you, declare you not guilty, and hold those who cause your suffering accountable for every sin they committed against you with their lips and with their life until they repent, turn to Jesus, and ask for forgiveness. Look in the mirror today. Ask yourself, how far am I from the image of Christ? When they revile me, do I revile back? When they slander me, do I get on the phone, slander back? Do I put things on Facebook, on Instagram? Do I call up everybody I know and try to destroy their name? Or do I entrust myself to God who judges righteously? Conform to the image of Jesus. And trust yourself to God like Christ. Endure unjust suffering like Christ. And then, number three, empathize with those in sin like Christ. At verse 24, Peter writes this. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live the righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. Author J. Allen Peterson, he once wrote, I read about a small boy who was consistently late coming home from school. His parents warned him one day that he must be home on time that afternoon. But nevertheless, he arrived later than ever. His mother met him at the door and said nothing. At dinner that night, the boy looked at his plate. There was a slice of bread and a glass of water. He looked at his father's full plate and then looked at his father. His father said nothing. The boy was hungry and crushed. The father waited for the full impact to sink in. Then without saying a word to his son, he took the boy's plate and placed it in front of himself. He then took his own plate of meat and potatoes and put it in front of the boy. Then he smiled at his son. When that boy grew to become a man, he said, all my life, I've known what God is like by what my father did that night. The father empathized with his son. When my daughters were young, one of them did what my bride and I told her not to do and said that if she did this thing, she would be punished. Knowing we had to keep our word to my bride's dismay, I took my daughter in the basement with our attitude adjustment tool and placed my daughter across my knee, grieving in my spirit because I did not want to spank her, knowing my wife was also grieving and looking in the eyes of my daughter, seeing fear all across her face, worried and praying and hoping that I would not do what I was about to do. I lifted the belt and I could not beat her, but instead, I beat my own back seven times and then hugged my daughter. I empathized with her and took her place in suffering 
so she could be spared. We sin, but Christ put on a body so that he could take our place in suffering for sin. He died in our place so that we would be viewed as though we died. Now, we can live to engage in what is right since we died for sin through Christ. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Our relationship with God was healed by his wounds on the cross. I know they messed up when they called you to suffer. I know they insulted you. I know they slandered you. They turned others against you. I know they lied on you. I know they did evil towards you. You know it and God knows it. Have empathy. Don't do to them what they did to you. Bear this suffering on their account as I bore the suffering my daughter deserved on her account. Ask the Lord to forgive them for what they did to you as through Jesus you have been forgiven for what you did to God. Take the suffering for them. I know they hurt you. I know they mistreated you. I know you're in pain. But get down on your knees and you say, Lord, enough suffering has already occurred for this sin. Please let my suffering be sufficient for the sin they committed against me. As Jesus says, Lord, let my suffering on the cross be sufficient suffering for the sins they've committed against you. Say, Lord, please forgive them for what they've done to me. Charge my suffering to their account. Charge the suffering of Jesus to their account. Let his thorns, let his beating, let the abuse he endured, let that be enough punishment to free them of their guilt. Please, Lord, I know they hurt me, but don't let anyone else have to suffer for their sins, not even them. Enough grieving has already occurred. Enough crying has already occurred for that sin. Enough people have been in pain because of the choice that they made. Enough weeping has already occurred. I've shed enough tears for them and for myself. Let that be enough. Don't hold it to their account. Set them free from the suffering I've endured because of what they did. As Christ empathized with us so we can be free of guilt and punishment for sin, become like Christ. Empathize with others who have committed sin and ask the Lord to free them of their guilt and the punishment they deserve for their sin. Christ left us an example of empathy. He suffered for you so you would not have to suffer. Ask the Lord to let Christ's suffering and yours be sufficient for the sins they've committed against you. Enough suffering has already taken place. Them weeping, them crying will do nothing to remove the pain. Only forgiveness will deal with the pain. Say, Lord, as Jesus took my suffering so I could be forgiven, let my suffering for that sin be sufficient to release them from their guilt. Empathize like Christ did for you. And lastly, encourage those who are strained to return to Christ. Peter writes at verse 25, For you will continually string like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. When someone asks you, How do
do you endure being mistreated while doing right and don't try to get even? How do you do that? When they ask you, how do you allow people to verbally abuse you and not respond the same way but keep saying, I'm just going to trust myself to the Lord? When people ask you, how do you not want to get even with those who caused you so much suffering, but you keep saying Christ suffered so you could be forgiven? They need forgiveness just like you do. How do you empathize with them who sin against you like that? How do you do these things? Tell them that you were continually straying like sheep. You were verbally abusing back at one time. You were straying like sheep. You were trying to get even at one time. You were trying to cause those who made you suffer to also suffer. One time you were straying like sheep. But you returned to the shepherd of your soul, the garden of your soul. And your shepherd is now leading and guiding you on how to live righteously. Tell them you died to sin and can't live in it no longer. Tell them your shepherd is helping you conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Tell them each day you look in the mirror to see how close you are to the image of Christ. You look to see where you've come from, how much more you need to grow. You see areas where discipline still needs to occur in your life and priorities that still need to change. But tell them each day you can see that you're not all you used to be. You used to be. But thanks be to God, because of your shepherd, because you can see the image of Christ before you, tell them you're not what you used to be and you're not what you're going to be. But slowly, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, study by study, prayer by prayer, you're becoming more and more like Jesus. Conforming to the image. You're following his example. You're walking in his steps. Day by day. You're becoming like Christ. Tell them. You can do it. Because you've got an image set before you. An example. In Jesus. Who did it for you. And he's working on the inside. So you become more and more like him. It's not you. It's him and you. It's the one that's greater than you than he that is in the world changing you, shaping you, breaking you, molding you, making you, giving you a new life, a new walk, a new talk. You've come a mighty long way, but you got some ways to go. Tell them, because of Jesus, I've got to change my life. Tell them, I encourage you to return to Christ, the garden of your soul, who died for your sins and not only left me an example, but left you one too. Tell them, if they come back to Jesus, they'll be able to do the very same things to endure unjust suffering. Tell them, if they come back to Jesus, they'll be able to entrust themselves to the Lord just like you. They'll be able to empathize with those who are still in sin. And they'll be desirous of encouraging others to return to Jesus Christ. God bless your hearts. I love you. I appreciate you. Do everything you can to fit into that image that God left us of Christ Jesus. You can do it. Have faith. Surrender to Christ. Give him your life. Become like Christ. Surrender to Christ. Become like Christ. Most gracious God, our Father, I pray for these precious believers listening today. Many have been suffering unjustly. And they're wondering, Lord, 
How do they endure suffering without sin? They've got to conform to the image of Christ. They've got to entrust themselves each and every day to you. They've got to remember that you judge righteously. You will exonerate them one day. They'll hear you say, well done. Tell them they've got to empathize with sinners even as Christ empathized with us. And then, Lord, tell them, help them to encourage others to become like, to come back to Christ. I just thank you, Lord, for today's word, the chance to share with the believers. Help each one of us each day become more like Jesus. We love you, we bless you, we praise you, we thank you. In the wonderful and glorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Jesus, oh Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We come with you. Help us, Lord. Help us get to the place where we can say enough suffering has taken place. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I love you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Won't you give the Lord some praise right where you are? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the truth of your word. I love you, people of God. Bow your heads for one second and just say with me, Lord, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe he is Lord and King. I believe he came into this world to die for my sins. And after dying, he rose three days later, ascended back to glory, and sits at the right hand of God. Through faith in Jesus, I can be saved. I receive you as my Savior and Lord of my life. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, that you might lead me in all truth. Write my name in the book of life and add me to that number that you shall return to get and resurrect to eternal glory. I thank you for salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't have a church home, I certainly extend an invitation to you to be a part of Fort Washington Baptist Church. You can send a message via Facebook this way or go to our website. Let us know you don't have a church home and you'd like Fort Washington Baptist Church to be your home. If you've accepted Christ today, let me know that also. If the message blessed you today, let me know that also. You can do that on Facebook or you go to our website. Let me know it ministered to your soul today. It certainly touched me before it touched you. I thank God for your presence and your attention. Please do make sure you share the message. At this time, we want to take our Holy Communion. So please make sure you grab your juice and your bread, and then we will take communion. Amen. We'll grab it now. Let me turn to a passage of scripture that I'll share with you before we take the elements. In 1 Corinthians, chapter number 11, it reads this way at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, 
he took the cup at the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Father, we thank you for the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We receive the elements today with gladness of heart, thanking you for your sacrifice on Calvary. Amen. The body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, won't you take and eat? Lord, thank you for your body given to bear the punishment of sin for our sins. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now the juice, representing the blood of Christ, let's take and drink together. Lord God, we thank you for the blood poured out as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Amen. Thank you for joining me this first Sunday of August. Next week, if the Lord keeps us here, we will start chapter 3 of 1 Peter, where we will look at finding harmony in marriage. Um, I pray that it would bless you. On Wednesday, we'll continue with our study on regeneration. I pray that you'll be able to join us. Make sure again today you share the message. Let me know if the message blessed you. I certainly wanted to. Um, if you feel inspired and you want to bless Fort Washington, um, please go to our church website, www.fortwashingtonbaptist.org, and select Give the Fire, and you can bless us with a love offering. Or if you just want to say the service and um, the ministry here is encouraging to you, let us know that as well. We love you and we appreciate you. To our saints who are on the line, we thank God for each of you. Um, just a bit of good news. Our sister uh, in Christ, Sister Alethea Hamilton, um, has, by the grace of God, been able to retire as of Friday from her years of working um, in education. And now she's going to be full-time doing ministry and taking care of her husband. Amen. Praise the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Somebody said take care of her husband is a full-time job alone. So we just pray the Lord would give her strength and her new full-time occupation of being a darling bride to her loving husband. We just are so happy for her having completed her years of working um, in that industry and now can devote the time to something else. God bless you, people of God. You stay encouraged. I love you. Keep that image in front of you and become like Christ. Love you now. Bye-bye.